All right, so thank you guys for joining us today. I know it's a super busy time of the year, so thank you for being here. Um, so this is the first part of our Building Strong Apps Tech Lunch series. Um, today we're going to cover the planning phase, and the next Thursday we're covering the construction side. So hopefully you can come back for that part. Um, so we're happy to welcome Gregory Butler. Um, he's a digital technology and content executive. Um, he has extensive national and international experience related to the funding, development, and operational aspects of launching a successful startup. He's currently the CEO of Dublin-based Whole, Whole World Band, um, and he's also an advisor to several US-based groups. So I assume a lot of you guys are here because you have ideas for apps that you want to develop. Um, so he's here today to guide you guys through the process of defining and vetting ideas. So some of you are already in that phase. Putting together a proposal, the funding process, and bringing the product to market. And any other questions that you guys might have, so you know, feel free to bring up other topics as well. Um, there is a guide with addi additional resources and recommendations, and the URL for that is on the handout, so just make sure you guys grab one of those on your way out. Oh, and at the end we have a Q&A, and we'll just bring those little um, handheld mics out around so that we can record your questions as well, so people watching this later can actually hear them. Hello. <laughs> um, thanks for coming out. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is a subject matter that we could spend many, many hours talking about. I'm going to try to condense it all into a pretty small frame, and I'm going to approach it from possibly a more philosophical uh, perspective than maybe most would expect, but that's because you can go out and you can you know, do a nice Google search to find out what a term means. But to find out why you need to know that term is a little more important. Um, and to start, why the hell should you listen to me? That is the best question I could come up with. Um, and I use this stupid photo because I found it the day that I was making these slides. Um, but I started out in music. And uh, music has an, interesting, has an interesting parallel to the tech world. Um, one is that the actual way you approach a startup is very similar to how the music industry and even the entertainment industry in general work. Uh, number two, the music industry was probably one of the most notable early disrupted entities where the music industry was just completely ripped, had its feet ripped out from underneath it. Um, and I got to experience that. Luckily, I was able to transition and kind of do television and things like that. But in going through that, I immediately understood that technology was changing in a way that you had to be aware of technology all the time from that moment on and that I couldn't sit back. Um, while I was doing music, I also started a, a company that uh, built computers for music production. We were a system integrator, so then I became more involved in tech started consulting for tech companies, and then a few years ago just decided I really didn't want to do music anymore. I actually liked tech and startups far more. Uh, for kind of the same reason that I stopped being in a band. I liked working behind the scenes because I could work on all different kinds of records, and with tech I could be in all different kinds of fields, and yet at the same time do the same thing within them. So that was a lot of fun for me. So that's what led me to standing in this library talking to you. Um, I'm sure many of you either have an idea for something you want to do, or you think that you will in the future have an idea for something that you want to do. Uh, and this is where I have to say the most painful thing I can possibly say. Your idea is worthless. <laughs> okay? Everyone has ideas. People talk to me about ideas all the time. The idea itself may be phenomenally interesting, and it may have all kinds of potential, but just having an idea means nothing. And I'll take you back to the entertainment industry where an idea is everything. Because you can say, hey, I have this idea for a film where this like mechanized cyborg thing comes back in time to try to kill somebody, and then they stop him, but he ends up being the kid or the guy and the dad, and everyone goes, yeah, sure, go write that up, and I'll pay you a million dollars, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's not how this is. This is all about execution. Because every idea that you have, someone else has had that idea before. And possibly someone at a company that is extremely large, and maybe they've already vetted it, and already know that it's not a, uh, an idea that can be brought to market, 
or maybe they just did it because it didn't make enough money for them. All of these different things that can occur. So it's not about coming up with a great idea. Everyone's sitting around waiting for the great idea. It's about actually having an idea that you can execute, that you can take to market, that you can get funding for, that you can do all these things. That's what's going to make you actually be successful. Um, so whatever you may be shooting towards, just always keep in mind that you don't need some moment of incredible inspiration. You need to be able to understand your own ability to take it and do something with it. That's what you want to be able to do. And, and then the other part of that is don't protect your idea like it's worth a billion dollars because it isn't. You know, you can, you can talk to people about it. I meet a lot of people who, um, I don't know if I can tell you everything about it. It's like, what do you think I'm going to do? <laughs> do you think that I'm going to hear your idea and turn around and think that I'm going to go, you know, just make that because you had a good idea? I understand that's important to you, but I happen to know that it's an enormous amount of work to actually get this thing up and running. So I'm not thinking about doing that. Tell me your idea, and then I can tell you whether I think you're going to be able to fund it, whether it's actually going to be able to go out, what, what some of the barriers are going to be. I'll put that in with the caveat that don't tell it to Google mm -hmm. or Facebook. Don't tell it to an entity that can actually do it in five minutes. <laughs> you know, So that's the one area where you may want to protect your idea. But otherwise, if you're just talking with people, don't be afraid because they may give you feedback that either makes your idea a lot better or gets you to realize that your idea isn't as good as you thought it was in the first place. So don't, don't treat your ideas as if they're some precious thing, as if they have the value. Now, the next couple things I'm going to talk about actually come out of um, kind of one of the primary books for me, which is The Art of War. And when you look at this, when you're starting out knowing yourself, and knowing yourself means a few different things here. Uh, Number one, it means knowing what your skill set is and what your fortitude is. Because the dream that you had about this idea of becoming large and making you a billionaire has many years of, of, of stress and strain involved in it. And you have to kind of have an understanding of what you're up for. You know? So know who you are in that way. Then you have to know your actual skill set. Are you a person who can go out and convince people of something? Are you a person who can build the actual product that you want to make? Where is your expertise? What are you actually bringing to the table that is going to help make this a reality? Because I can tell you, if you don't have any of the skill sets except for the idea, you've already set yourself up because now you have to either hire a bunch of people or bring in a lot of people as partners to take it to market. So you have to have some understanding in that way. And then last, I'm going to wrap into know yourself as your actual idea. You have to know your own idea. And you have to know what, where it sits in the marketplace, what it means. So this is the know yourself portion of this. Then, of course, you have know your enemy. So in knowing your enemy, what you're saying is the marketplace Who's out there that either is doing what you're hoping to do or is doing um, something that they could benefit from you, anything like that, but getting an understanding of what's out there. Because again, you're still in the early stages. Right now, we're still just sitting at home thinking or talking to some friends. This is the moment where you want to get an understanding of, of how real this potential is. And in, in knowing all of this, um, you know, you can look at something and say, oh, we all know Google today. Well, for those of us a little older, we also know Alta Vista. You know, there's been, you know, there were, you know, uh, there's Earthlink, there's, you know, uh, you know, and even, geez, you know, MySpace before Facebook. So, you know, you can, you can have someone out in the marketplace who is significantly larger doing a similar thing, but you have to understand what's going to, you know, make you better and what's going to, um, uh, uh, make you successful. So you have to kind of take all of this in. And then also, I'm going to wrap another part of, of the airport into the Know Your Enemy, which is also kind of knowing the landscape and the terrain in general. So as I spoke about before with music, 
Once I realized that tech could disrupt my way of life at any moment, I had to be able to understand that every single process that I went through would have the same experience in some way or another. Um, so if you're going to build an app, you should be thinking about, is the money actually going into the thing that I want to build? You know, because if you set out to do a music app right now, good luck. Nobody wants to put money into a music app. So it doesn't matter if the idea is great. So you want to have a sense of where, where are things going for where money is being invested? What are the kinds of things that could stop what I'm trying to do in the future? Um, there's a famous example of a company that uh, uh, has had $125 million invested into it, into a product that basically you can squeeze with your hands that they built a giant machine to do, right? So it's, it's kind of like you go through this whole process, like you want to really have a, a sense of um, uh, what, is, what is that core element about what's going on that isn't going to uh, uh, go off the rails just because someone instantly thought of something else, like you, you kind of over-engineered or went too far. You want to know what everyone else is doing and what you're doing and how it fits in, and you want to stop right there. All right. So along these lines, a lot of people will go in, now you figured all this stuff out, and you're thinking, Okay, let's put together our business plan, you know, and you're going to sit down and you're going to write these 20 pages and you've done all your research. And, and I would say, and I'm not alone in this, that you should do it in the opposite way. You should come up with the simplest description you can for what you're doing and then work everything else out along the lines of that. Now, as elevator pitches go, some people think that it's a paragraph, some think it's a sentence, some... You know, there, there's all kinds of takes, but what I'm putting forward here is that you just want to be able to sum things up very quickly and succinctly, and every word matters. So in this example that I put together, even though it just seems like I, I threw a sentence out there, the fact is I said, we've. We've, okay, so there's a team of us. This is certainly more than me. And I definitely didn't say I created, because if I say I created, now I've focused it back on me as an ego, and I better be a coder. Because if I said I created, but actually I had someone else code it, well now I'm, I'm, I'm basically misleading them and kind of putting myself in a different space. So we've created an app, all right, and I've told them that it's software that enables. So when I say enables, I've kind of told them it's a tool. You know, I'm not really as much talking about, it might be a platform, but I'm really talking about a tool when I say enable, and then I'm going to bring these people, enables users. Users is probably not a B2B play, so I'm really probably talking about end users, people who would just be out there doing something. Uh, to view the human soul. Okay, powerful. I wish I came up with, if I had the tech behind that, I think it would sell really well. But this is just the simple idea. And from that, everything else is going to come out of it because I can always look back to this and think, am I hitting that perfect, uh, you know, kind of one sentence description? Is it all falling into line? And if it doesn't, then I have to figure out what I have to adjust. When you make a sprawling, giant business plan with all these descriptions, it's far more difficult for you to go in and pinpoint when you've gone off track. So you always want to have something to come back to. Um, and also, the truth is, when you read this, no matter who you are, you think, I have all the information. I know whether I'm interested or not immediately. If you have to say many things to get your point across, you are making the wrong product. Because users, and, and always come back to this, you're a user too. If you have to go through five or seven stages, if you have to read tutorials to get in and figure out how to use an app, you're lost, you know? So your description is there. Now again, if you're making a professional application, I'll, I'll put that caveat, you're, you have an experience, expertise, something that's going on that you know you're gonna use it in that way. But if you're doing something that's going out customer facing, you've always gotta be thinking about that, that user experience. They'll talk more about that next week. <laughs> but for right now, that's where we are. So you have your idea. Your next step is actually going to be putting together your pitch deck. Um, I've seen pitch decks that are 100 slides. Um, uh, the example that I gave over for uh, uh, Guy Kawasaki, I think it's like 10 slides is his thing. You can certainly 10 to 15 slides is good. What you should think about is, is that every slide has a whole story behind it, and you need to be prepared to tell that story, document that story. But when you're in the room pitching, everything is about one slide. You want to tell whatever area that is in just that one slide. So the first thing is the challenge. A lot of people call this a problem. I've had a debates 
Uh, I, don't, I just don't like the word problem, and I don't like starting out a presentation with the word problem. I don't want people thinking about a problem. I want them thinking about a challenge. A challenge is something you overcome. It's something that we all face. So I always describe it as a challenge. So the challenge, of course, in the marketplace is that you can't see into someone's soul. Okay, so, so, so that's your challenge, right? But you lay that out. You lay out whatever it is you're working on. What is, what is it people want to overcome? What do they need to get through? Because that's, if, if you're not solving something, if you're not getting past a challenge, you're gonna have a difficult time with your product anyway. You know, every product in, or app or whatever you would call it, at some point is solving something, even if it's solving boredom. You know, if it's a game, whatever, it has to solve something. So then, of course, the solution. Well, lo and behold, your product is the solution, right? You know, that's, that's what this is about. You've showed them what the, what the issue is. Now you've showed them that you and your product are the solution. Number three, as the exception, or what makes you exceptional, or what is different. What is it about the thing that you're doing that's going to stand out? I'll go back to, you know, the, the Facebook versus MySpace or what have you. You know, your, what makes you exceptional, or this product exceptional, whatever, it might be your relationships. It might be that you feel that your expertise is different than everyone else's, or you're viewing it from a different matter. Um, the holy grail is that you actually have something that's patentable. Right, that can be controlled in some way that everyone else is going to need. Um, I wouldn't rely too much on that. Uh, getting patents has become phenomenally difficult in tech because they started out giving them to everyone for everything. And now you have these groups out there that hold patents to very simple technologies that have to be used everywhere. So they basically just, sh they, you know, they just shut everything down. Uh, you know, so don't. You know, don't focus a lot of energy on that, but if you're genuinely developing something that you're like, we've got something here that's truly different and identifiable, then, you know, then take it there. Um, next up is the model. So the model is how you're going to make your money. You know, we're not, um, there, was, there was a point, you know, obviously there was the bubble about, you know, God, it's almost 20 years. Now, the, the, that was because truly, as we said, the, the, there was this kind of entertainment music approach to it and everything was about the idea and everything was exciting and people were just throwing money at things. It's not like that today. Um, you can certainly come into a business saying, hey, we're not going to charge anything at first because we want to get people using it, we want to test it, whatever your reasons might be. But at some point, you have to be able to explain how these investors are going to get their money back, you know, whoever they are and whatever level that is. Um, next is the plan. So what, how are we actually going to market? What is this? So, you know, I've told you we're going to make some money out of it and here's how we're going to make that money. Here's kind of how long it's going to take to some degree, although not about the money, but at least how long you see this plan having to play out. Competition. Again, back to the MySpace Facebook thing. It's like understanding what might be missing uh, or understanding what you have to overcome. Most people hate the competition slide because it's the one that attacks their sense of self, right? My idea is great. We don't have any competition. This is just it. We're, we're awesome. Uh, but if you're not perpetually checking what other people are doing, um, you're kind of lost. And, if you, and, and remember, this is the deck you're making to go get investment. If, if the investors feel that you haven't done your homework or you're not on top of what else is out in the marketplace or what could be coming in the marketplace, um, if I were them, I would not put money into it because I, uh, all I'm hearing is someone's ego. You know, I, I want to know that you know the space. That's, if you don't have expertise in the space, where are we? You know, if you're the one asking for the money. Um, next is projections. Uh, <laughs> this can kind of depend on the level of investor that you have, but every investor you will ever meet likes one diagram, and it's a hockey stick. And the hockey stick is, oh, we're not making money, we're making a little money, oh my God, we just made a billion dollars, you know? So they're not looking for steady growth most of the time. Again, I'm not telling you this is a hard and fast rule, it depends on the, the sector that you're in and the kind of investors that you're trying to get, but <laughs> this is a moment where everything is exponential and people expect revenues to be exponential. Um, 
So we, you know, we don't have time for a business to build over 10 or 20 years. You know, a business has to build in three to five years. That's how everyone is looking at everything. So, you know, when you're looking at re your revenue projections, I'm not telling you to make them up. What I'm telling you is, if your projections don't match investor expectations, you're talking to the wrong investors because that's what they're going to want to see. You know, if you're if you're looking for what I'll vaguely call serious money, and I'll get into investors in a second. And then the status. Where are you? Have you made it? Do you have a prototype? Do you have a team? Who's on your team? You know, have you, if you launched, when did you launch? What, what has come out of that? You didn't launch, why haven't you launched? All of these sorts of things, one slide, <laughs> quickly summing up where you are. And there's a few slides I've left out of here um, that I think depend on where you are in, in, in your organization. So, you know, you might have a team. If you have a team, you probably want to talk about them. You want to make that later on, unless you have someone that's so impressive on your team that everyone who you're speaking to will listen to you because that person's on your team. Um, so a few other things. You can go look at all different kinds of versions of it. Um, I will tell you, uh, either go and find, and there's tons of websites where you can buy great templates to make it out of, or find a designer, put your money into this. If you're going out to pitch and there's typos and it doesn't look beautiful and all that sort of thing, you, again, you're, you're probably going to lose. If, if you're dealing with um, uh, investors who you know, are, are maybe more educated in the, in the space, you, you really want people to feel like at every step of the way you're paying attention. The reason you want them to feel like that is because you want it to be true. And this is part of that. So. This is something that for years I've been thinking about. I've been trying, you know, because I meet with so many investors, I have so many shareholders that I know and have, and have been through the process both as, a, as a, someone who's done startups and working in startups. And I used to think about all of these kinds of dynamics of um, what triggered investors to do things. Um, and then it hit me that I was completely wrong. And in fact, the only two kinds of investors there are is people who can afford to invest and people who can't. And you want to do everything you can to not have the people who can't afford it in your shareholder base. And unfortunately, those are usually the first investors. And I don't say unfortunately for them or for you, but I say unfortunately in the general sense that usually your first access point is family members, friends, people who can give you that ten or $20,000 or even $50,000 which, to be fair, to start out a lot of companies, you don't need more than that. But what you've just done is you've taken money from someone who genuinely needs it back. And to take a flyer on you. And if you have too many of those people, they're, you're affecting all of your relationships down the line. Uh, and what you really want the best case scenario is people who can write that check because they're placing bets all over the place. If you're thinking about it like a gambler, they're walking up to the roulette table and they're spreading across, you know, nine numbers, 16 numbers, and they're just playing it out. And if they hit, they hit. Not that big of a deal, you know. So if you're, you know, most people do go out to their immediate network first to try to find investment. If you're speaking to someone, don't get caught up in your desire to be successful. Make sure that they are fully aware of the risk that they are entering into. And if you can, I would honestly tell them like, hey, give me the money. <laughs> or loan me the money. But, and then, you know, if I hit, I'll give you this. But in this moment, just think of it like you're giving me $25,000. And if you can afford to give me $25,000 and never think of it again, we're in great shape. But if you're pulling out of your, you know, your retirement and you're concerned about this money or you're taking out a second mortgage or whatever's going on, you know, unless you're prepared and worked out a plan for paying it back, you, know, you don't want to be two years or five years down the road. You don't want to be up late at night through all the stresses that you're going to have of trying to get this company off the ground with your aunt calling you. You know, really. I mean, this is, this is you know, and, 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 you know, the best case scenario for any company is that you actually only have um, what I'll call vaguely medium to large investors in it because, again, they can write the checks. They can also follow their money. 
And that's a term, once you get at this, that you really want to pay attention to. Because if all of your investors are people who can't write another check, that means you are starting over the next time you have to get money. You have to go back out and find completely different people to do different things. And those new people who come in aren't going to care at all about the investment that was made by the others. So at the very least, you want to like grow your networks that you have some more. You can go online, you can find all kinds of people, you know, you can find all kinds of angel and seed groups and all these sorts of things. I'm not going to go into big detail, that's a Google search away. Um, but you, you know, you want to find these, you want to build that network to try to get something out of it. The raise. This, again, very much like the entertainment industry. When you get that first record deal, oh my god, you made it, it's over, you're done, you're rich. And. <laughs> In so many people in startups get into that mode of like, if I just raise the money, somehow I've made it and I'm done. And in fact, all that you've really done is you've created a lot more pressure on yourself. Uh, and, and that's good pressure, that's what you want. But, but you can't look at it like, um, oh, I made the money and now it's going to be easy from here. Because if you're successful, you're actually going to have to raise money many times over. You know, you simply, you know, uh, as a founder or CEO, you end up spending most of your time raising money because you're either raising that first bit of money, you launch to start making it, and you immediately start setting up the narrative for your next raise. And you're spending your time network, proving your case, doing all of that sort of thing. Um, you know, so we go back to kind of skill sets here as well. When you get a chance to raise money, to go in and do these pitch meetings, there's all kinds of different people. Do your research. Uh, try to understand who you're meeting with. Um, I would advise you, certainly when you just start out, um, how can I say this? You, be mindful of meeting with companies that are very large. And I, I don't say this as much because there's necessarily something wrong with them, but because if you don't have the infrastructure and the experience to handle a company of that size, number one, they might just be meeting with you to find out what you have to say. Uh, and them finding out what you have to say when they deal with all these other companies that they invest in who may be in the same area of you is, is not the best position for you to be in. Uh, number two, if you're trying to raise a quarter million dollars or half a million dollars and they only invest five million and they only invest in you know, a series, well, let's, let's say they only invest in series B, which means you, you're supposed to already have revenue coming in. Why are you even meeting with them? Because you got excited because they have a big name? Don't do it. You know, find, find the, the groups that are investing in the thing that you're doing or find the people. Um, you know, don't get, don't get trapped in the big name. Just sit there and say what's right for you at this point. Uh, and again, do, do that research. But going in and doing the race is really about getting in the room with people who can understand your value proposition. They understand either that hockey stick or they understand your product, but they need to understand at least one or the other. You know, are they either just, are they placing lots of bets all over this area, even though they don't know it, and they just figure someone's gonna solve it, it might be you, um, or do they actually have expertise in this area and it's a place that they genuinely are gonna push you and, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, you know, the race itself we can talk about for a long time. There's so many dynamics to it, but again, going back to just simply try to find the right people to be meeting with. Do, do your work, don't just throw it out everywhere um, because that, that, that's draining. And, and, and whatever disappointments you may have experienced in your life, nothing will be as disappointing as raising money. It is truly just the most grueling experience you will ever have. Um, and it's only through being rejected, you know, a thousand times that you'll start to go, okay, I'm just raising money or whatever, we're either going to make it or we're not. You know, and you just kind of fight through it and, you know, everything happens in, in you know, the 11th hour, everything is a stretch. Um, uh, here's the downside of raising money. <laughs> Once you actually raise the money, you now have these shareholders, you have board members, you know, depending on how you structure your company. Um, the craziest thing is they actually want to give you more money. One, because they want you to be successful. That's the kind of best side of it. But the other part is money is control. And 
once you've got the thing up and running, now you're, the moment you've raised that first money, you're actually even more desperate than you were before because now you actually have to keep this thing going. So every time you think about money, you know, you just want to take that pressure off your back. You think, oh, if we had another million dollars, okay, I'm going to call up the shareholders and, I, I, you know, there's a couple of them that I think I can put that check in. There, if you haven't proven your case yet, and they give you money, they're getting something back. You know, they're putting money into to create more leverage. And the further you go in, the harder it becomes. And there are so many stories of companies that have raised enormous amounts of money against things that could have never possibly supported that kind of money. Because th the other part is the pushers actually like to push too. So everyone gets into this dance where they're just throwing money around. Um, and, and when you're sitting here without that sounds very exciting and wonderful, but if you're actually, if you genuinely believe in your idea and you're not just there to be rich, assuming that rich just means getting money in, um, you really have to understand the game that's occurring. And you have to be able to say, hey, I, I don't actually, I truly don't need this money right now. Or, you know, we need to prove a little bit more, we need to do more to, to get through this. Um, or, um, you know, what, what am I really sacrificing here? Can I hold out a little bit longer, maybe find an investor who, who isn't taking quite as much? Because we're all in this totally nebulous world of valuation, uh, and it's, it's completely make-believe. It changes all the time. Are there parameters within business? Of course there are. Do people ignore the parameters every single day? You know, so it all depends on where you are and what's happening. This is a change maker. <laughs> if you know anyone, or if you ever yourself call yourself a change maker, this is actually the only change maker. Why I'm showing you this is because don't walk into a room, you, you're raising money, you're doing all of this stuff, whatever your idea is, whatever is happening, don't get caught up in the idea that you are doing something so supremely important that everyone has to give you whatever you want. And don't believe in hype. And I've seen, back to this rock star kind of thing, I've seen people who are rock stars of raising money. And they spend their time believing so much and people want to have that Pied Piper experience and follow behind them. But the fact is, you're doing something and you should be confident in what you're doing, but don't let the ego run away. You've done this whole process you have the money, you've raised the money, go do the work. Don't, don't feel like you, you've proven anything yet. And don't, um, you know, and I can appreciate there's people in this room who might be coming with an idea that's going to save lives. That's amazing. But it's still just a process. It's still just a thing that's occurring. And don't let yourself run away with it. Take all of these things on board and just simply come to it with a work ethic that delivers because going back to the very first thing, it's all about execution. Live in the execution of your plan. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Do I have any answers? Sure. Um, so you talk, oh, sorry. Oh, wait, 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 wait for the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I had, is that on? It's on. Okay, so um, you talked a lot about having a team, mm -hmm. uh, teamwork in this. Do you have any uh, things to recommend about the ideal size of the team or the kinds of people you would want on your team? Like what? what yeah, kind so, of well, I can tell you the. This is all going to depend on the product you're making, right? I mean, if you're manufacturing something, your team may need to be significantly better, or bigger, but. My experience, and, and I'll say this about everything that I've said to you, total grain of salt. You could have someone come in here and say some very different things. Um, I think that the ideal team is two people <laughs> to start. One person who knows how to make the product and one person who knows how to do the business. Um, you can have one person who can do both. Um, I, I haven't met them, again, but you know, there was, you know, um, there's a Prince and a Neil Young too, so there's people who can do all kinds of stuff. But, but you know, the, 
you, you, having two people allows you to at least bounce ideas, right? And uh, to kind of keep each other in check. And having two people allows someone to focus on doing what they do best. Um, what I will also tell you is, it is terrifying to be in a situation where the person who has the idea can complete none of the process, right? You know, so if you can't do the business side, you know, or if you can't do the, the uh, well, I'll vaguely call the engineering or the, you know, the kind of development side of, of the project, now you have to hire or partner with two people at a minimum who can do that, and there's gonna be people beyond that too. So it's, it's kind of, you know, going back to that know yourself, it's, it's trying to understand if you're really the right person to do it, you know. So you talked about um, like proof of concept. Mm -hmm. How important is it to have a working proof of concept before you would go to an investor and ask for money? This is um, a, a pretty debatable area, right? So I think in a best case scenario, you would love to have uh, something that you can at least walk through. And there are things you can do without having to build the app to get there. Um, sometimes I'll do it where we'll build a video. You know, just make a video walkthrough that shows how it's supposed to work um, and then be able to tell why we can get there and why we can get there quickly. Do we already have the existing technology? Is it off-the-shelf technology? Here's what the developers we're working with have told us it will take to build this. Um, this in part can depend on the kinds of investors you're speaking to as well. There's plenty of angel level investors who are gonna sit there and they expect you to not have the product or a prototype or something like that really working. Um, but uh, you know, when Ben comes in next week, that's kind of what they do. One of the things they do is they kind of workshop through getting you to that point where you at least have something that you can show to people. Um, but it's, it's really funny because it has much more to do with the investors than it does with you. You know, if there, there's people who you could sit down without even pitching, you know, with a proper presentation and just give that line and say, this is what we're gonna do. And they're like, okay, I wanna know, let's, let's go. You know, but the kind of more standard thing is just at least being able to present in some fashion how the thing's gonna work. And then I think it's up to you and your budget to figure out how to, how to get there. Now, if you talk about the proof of concept as a, as a um, uh, uh, as a stage, and so in other words, not just we're talking about beta of the software, but genuine, like if you were speaking to developers, what a proof of concept is, is more like, again, 20, 30, 40 pages of walking through something. That's something you can be doing as well to kind of work through and figure out everything about your product. Um, no investor is going to want to see that, you know, because they don't care. And I'm not saying they don't care in, in like, is that they don't care about where they're putting their money, but Getting someone, it, it, always come back to yourself. When you walk into a store, you don't want a 30-page description of the product. You just want to buy the product. You get excited because you look at it that looks cool, or you think about how it's going to change your life. So an investor is thinking about, will people respond to this? Are, and, and, and I've made the kind of error of, of, of speaking to someone saying, we're going to track this, we're going to do that, and the investor's like, no, no, no. And I was like, yeah, of course you don't care. You don't, you don't care how I'm spending the money in that way, or you don't want to be in the weeds on this. You just want to know, can I get from A to B, and, and is B eventually going to get us to, to Z? You know. Yeah. I have another question if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so how important do you think it is to get an investor that has maybe that um, kind of expertise in, in the sense that they can kind of guide and groom you if you are somebody who hasn't built a startup, for uh, example? There's... Um, there's a lot of different ways to approach this too. I, I think that having an informed shareholder base is important um, because then they you don't have to explain as much as what's happening. At the same time, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you just you want, you do want to get people to invest, and you you know you don't want to cherry pick to the point that you you close people out. Um, typically, if someone's going to invest or multiple people are going to invest, they're going to look at your skill set and the skill set of your team 
and probably figure out how much time they can invest in helping you, the kinds of people they can connect you to. Remember, once, once they put their money in, they're typically not going to be there every day helping you, but at the same time, they're going to set you up with people who are going to help you in some way, mm -hmm. because they might have a huge infrastructure in the things that they already do that made it so they can make all of this money. Um, you know, whether they're an organized investment group or whether it's an individual, they may also have a, a network around them uh, that plays into either what you're doing from a specific category perspective, from an investment perspective, what have you. I mean, it can be as simple as they may say to you, okay, you're small, you're obviously not going to have a CFO or anything, but we need to manage these funds because it's gonna, you're going to have to raise this amount of money over the next three years to hit, years to hit your target, so I'm going to interview you you to this person or this company and we're going to start structuring it so you know how to handle it. You know, stuff like that. Um, but, but here's the one thing I'll, I'll bring up. Um, do not expect your shareholders to be your friends. Because because they're not. Now, that doesn't mean you won't create a friendship naturally through them. But, uh, and I have, I, you know, you, you, will, you can do that. But, but never have that as an expectation. Because if you're looking for them to be your mentor, or if you're looking for them to always be looking out for you, remember that they have a split um, in the things that are their priorities. They have whatever it is that made the money <laughs> that they're giving to you. Um, they have the fact that they've invested in your company, and their goal is to leverage that at, to the highest extent that they can. And then at the, this other bit, they have the, they want the company to be successful, and they'll help you in some way. And that's that's a a uh, a very can be a very volatile situation as to how much they want to help you and how much they don't. And I don't say that from a negative perspective. You may not have shown the results. They may have spent more than than they were comfortable putting in. They feel like they don't know or they don't believe anymore. Something's happened in the marketplace that makes them change their mind. Um, uh, you know, so you you know you can't just look at it like they gave me money. We're we're awesome. They're going to help. They're going to do everything. So you kind of. You kind of have to just use your own intuition, your instinct, and just walk through and figure it out. Questions? I have one thing. Sorry, I'm not here, but I have some So this is a little bit of an off-the-wall question, a little outside of what you talked about, so feel free to say, no, I, I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, so you laid out, um, I thought, a really clear and useful help for like making that slide deck to talk to investors. Mm -hmm. Um, knowing that, at least for some of the folks in the room and for me as well, some of the apps that we're thinking about are not necessarily ones that are really going to make money, like a health-related app or uh -huh. something like that, where you know, you're know you sending a person a nutrition tip every day. Uh -huh. um, do you have any ideas or suggestions for how to either market those kinds of apps or find people to partner with you to help you uh, make them you know, get them, because uh, I know it costs money to get it into the app store and things like that, so you might need some money for small amounts of things like that, but you're never really going to make a huge investment off of it. It's not like a, you know, it's not intended in that way. I know you're speaking words, but I don't okay. know. Okay. No, because what I'm saying is like, you, 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 if, if you're not going to make money, then people aren't investing in it. What they're doing is their friends or family who are giving you money to complete something that's, okay. that's interesting to you, and, and the context of what we're talking about here is going to apply in certain ways, but think about, let's say you have an idea and you look at it, you've gone through this process and you said, you're right, I don't have a model. I, I don't have a way to really get to revenue. Um, but uh, you know, it's about healthy eating, making sure you're doing this and doing that. Yeah, Whole Foods could really use that. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now am I developing a B2B play? And I think that that's in part, uh, most people think about things uh, business to business okay, as opposed to a B2C business to consumer, right? Okay. So most people, when they think about products, they're, they're usually thinking about 7 billion people on the planet. How do I reach them? How do I make a penny from each person every day? You know, that kind of, right? You're yeah. just thinking about how do I, and, and, but your idea, if it's a good idea, it probably has a value to someone. So the question is, who does it have a value to? And you kind of draw yourself back from it and say, all right, yeah, I, I can run ads on it, but man, you have to have a lot of people to run ads. Nobody's really going to subscribe to this. Oh, but wait, well, maybe if it were part of Weight Watchers and it was saying that their food was the right thing, okay, well, now if I tell Weight Watchers, they're probably just going to do it. Yeah. Right? So now I have that problem. So what I should do is 
I should develop it to a certain extent, see if I can get some users in really quickly, come up with them. I'd come up with a marketing plan before I ever came up with the product because I'd be thinking like, can I leverage enough people to get people using it? Because that's the only reason the company's going to care, right? So I'm going to get these people, I'm going to get them in for free, and then, you know, for maybe if you're doing with you and your friends and your family, you're sitting back or maybe you find a developer who's going to help you with it to, you know, to own it 50-50. You do all of that, and for you guys, selling it for five or ten million dollars is a huge win. To investors, it's meaningless. For for for, yeah, for, yeah, the, for, the, the, for the hockey the stick, market. right? Yeah, yeah. You know, because they don't. You know, and, and that's you know something I've seen before too. I've, I've gone into pitches where um, you're trying to raise half a million dollars, and you're saying, "Yeah, we're going to raise half a million, and going to return 50, and everybody's like. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd much rather give you five million to return 500. You know, and it's like and you're sitting there going, yeah, but you know, and it's so, so it's it's kind of like you just have to. It, that goes back to who you're in the room with, understanding what you're trying to do. Um, but it, it, in, in an odd way, I look at this the same as as making music for uh, for TV shows, which is, I always tell people, don't self censor, make as much music as you can. There's always a need for your music, and just kind of put it out there. So it's kind of like saying, if you have an idea and you can bring it to market. As long as the idea is reasonably sane, you can probably find someone who can use it. You know, if you've identified that it doesn't exist already, right? right? So if it doesn't exist, you can kind of say, well, there, there's a thing for it. Do I have the skill set to get it to market and get people to hear about it? Which, similar to music, if you can't get it to market, have people hear about it, you can't do anything with it. So as long as you have that path, you're in good shape. Thank you. Yep. It's it's a um, what they want is a hundred percent, but they also are smart enough to know that uh, there has to kind of be a pool of shares available there. A standard, if we can call it that, this is the problem that the rules only apply in a general sense, and they never apply in the actual room because. People are just trying to find their balance. It's a negotiation. But I'd say in a general sense, you want to start out not giving up more than 20%, right? Because uh, you, you need, you, you have to, you have to be preparing for success. And if you're preparing for success, that means there are going to be follow-on rounds. You're going to have to keep raising money. You know, it's very rare that a, a, you know, an app or a product comes out and you're just making money so quickly that, you know, it's kind of out of control. Even if you have revenue, in year one, year two, and even if it's good revenue, you're going to need money to accelerate that growth. So however you cut it, you need more money. Uh, you know, uh, and, and how, you know, how much money equals that? The high side, unless, unless your idea and the team and everything behind it is so phenomenal, let's say you want to create something and you're like, well, I'm doing this, so I'm, I'm the shit. And I've got this person from MIT, and I've got this person from Stanford, and they're the shit, so we're all going to make a bunch of money. You better hope you can be with us when it happens. If you're in that space, well, maybe you can raise a lot of money against the idea just out of the gate. Um, but typically, you're going to be real high in valuation for something starting up might be four or five million dollars. That's for something pretty good. Um, again, unless the players involved are pretty established. Um, you know, but if you're going out to raise, well, and let's dial it back too. How much do you need to raise to do it? That's that's going to determine it as well. Um, hopefully, you can get to a different decent state by two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand max, because now you start to have a, a a product that has a value. It's had this amount of money invested in it. You know, so you could have said. Okay, our our company is is worth a million dollars. We've had two hundred thousand dollars invested in it. We're about ready to go into trials. Uh, people are responding well. Blah blah blah. And then, you know, now all of a sudden your company is worth three million dollars. So now the next people that come in are paying a premium against the people who came in first, right? So you're not giving up as much shares. So it's it's a dance, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no
So um, I think you kind of hit on it, but I'm not sure I was completely satisfied um, with what you said. But do you, do you build apps for like when you see an opportunity in a certain space, or do you kind of look at the spaces and say, I want to build in this space, and I'm going to make an app that kind of fits what I want to do in this space? Well, you, you should be starting from expertise mm -hmm. in something, right? So um, I personally, um, when people tell me an idea, and maybe they have some infrastructure, some ability to do something, um, I immediately ask them to quantify what they want from me. Right? How, how do I fit into this thing? Um, and when, if you're talking about going out as an investor or if you're talking about going out as a person who wants to be in technology and creating things, um, whatever it is, you, you have to understand your place in it. So if you're, um, you know, if you, and I'll go, you know, in a music thing, if you want to make a music app uh, and you say we can make money because we're going to do X, Y, Z, and then I look at you and I say, well, I, I get that you love music, but you actually have no understanding of the mechanics of how royalties are paid or how this is going to go down and, it's in, and your projections are way off. I don't care that you love music or that you have a, a, what seems to be a great idea because you don't have the ability to actually take the fruition. And I don't know if I'm going and answering this exactly, but it's... It, it's um, I don't know, because people just have lots of ideas that they think are solving some problem and they're not thinking about all the other people who have tried to solve that problem before. And there's a, um, one thing about disruption is that it does often come from people who don't know a lot about a certain area because they're coming into it clean and they're not thinking about all of the roadblocks and all that sort of thing. Um, but if you don't have the ability to do great analysis and understand what those roadblocks are and what the problems can be, then you're just setting yourself up to experience them. So, so for me, if I'm, if I'm speaking to companies, like I said, I just want to know how do I fit in because I may have a skill set that can be applied to something that I have no experience or expertise in their core business, but I'm just applying the thing I do to it and, and that's what they need, you know? You know, but 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 again, if you're if you're building an app and you're saying it's going to be for, um, uh, you know, pediatric healthcare, and you want me, or you want to do it, you have no experience in that. Then what what's the point? Why are you there? You know, is it just to make money? That's a bad bad reason to build something. You know. No. Can you speak to the kind of nuanced question of? Um, I think it helps. Care, generally, the temptations to say, I want to take some healthcare process and apply it to software, mm -hmm. and then that's an idea. Right. Um, so the, the nuance between what beyond applying some existing healthcare process to software is needed, is that, would you agree with that statement that software in the healthcare space is an idea that has to fit some nuance niche? And have real purpose beyond just making processes digital. Right. Well, I think that I, I think that's the last bit that you said. Just making yeah. processes digital is is really the question. Um, I think we can all think of many ideas that would make our day easier, you know. But the process of actually creating it, the process of going through all of these stages to get to um, taking it to market, and and all of these other things are really what it comes down to, and there has to be a tipping point somewhere where the idea actually has a logical payoff for everyone involved. Um, in, in medicine, uh, and however broad you want to take that, um, there is an enormous amount of money being invested um, because everyone knows that, again, back to the kind of exponential processing, that you know, the medical field is going to see a great deal of change. There's going to be all kinds of technology coming into the, to play. Um, so the question starts to become, is the idea you have that seems simple something that fits into a bigger frame that can be helpful to another process? And are you aligning what you're doing to put yourself in a position to participate in that? Right? Um, if it's not a thing that's worth investing in, in and of itself, if it just helps another part of the game. 
any final questions? No? No? All right, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you. you.